Welcome, folks. It's Art Wolf. Today we have a very special unboxing video. Very special for two reasons. One, Winter's Victory is here. And as our special guest this evening, we have Mr. Mark Hinkle. Mark, thanks for coming. Oh, thanks for having me. So this is uh, New England Simulations. And, and Mark, that's pretty much you, based on my understanding. I'm sure you got some folks helping out here and there. but Oh, uh, yes. Um, I have a a pretty good team in house um and i get a lot of support uh, mm -hmm. from them so it's about three or four uh, uh members that are regular nes associates um uh, mm -hmm. and uh they they help out a lot i it's i i can't do it without them and I uh of course the the key player at NES is my wife, Mihaila, who takes care of all the, the business end. So I don't have to deal with the ordering and the labeling and, the, you know, stuff like that. I can focus on, on the game and the creative side. Mm -hmm. Now, this is pretty much your solo design. Um, but it's based on an earlier, to some extent anyway, I, I want to ask that question, based on an earlier design by Frank Davis, of course, the game's Wellington's victory about Waterloo. Yeah. Yeah. So how close, in, in the end, I mean, I know that's kind of was kind of the idea to start with, but in, in the final analysis, now that we have Winter's victory out, how close do you feel like it stays to the original Wellington's victory system? By design, it stays pretty close to the Wellington's Victory orthodoxy. I I liked the original game. I liked it when it first came out. I continued playing it over the the decades, and uh, I nobody seemed to be doing anything with the game system. So, you know, I I took it on as uh, you know the orphan that it was, and. I uh, just really wanted to do something with it. And I've always, I like the Battle of Eilau and uh, I just thought it would be a good, uh, a good match. I can't um, help it before I even open this. I can't help but notice that up at the top, it says grand battles of the first empire. This means we'll be seeing more grand battles of the first empire. That's, 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 that's me being optimistic. <laughs> Okay, that's fair. But we'll 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 see how it goes, and we'll see how it's received. Uh, you know, there's um, there's a whole nother battalion level uh, game community out there that's centered around the La, La Bataille, uh system, and they've been around for a lot of years, and they have you know it's a very popular system, and uh, a lot of people like it, but. You know, I, I've talked to people over the years and I've talked to other people that have played Wellington's Victory and I've seen other people recently playing Wellington's Victory and I said, you know, I can I can pick up this system and, you know, give it give it new life, give it, uh, you know, a new, a new place. And hopefully it'll be received well enough that um, we'll be able to go on with, with other games. Well, you certainly haven't skimped on the physical presentation. Now, I was lucky enough to see this on a table at Compass Expo back in November, and I talked to those folks. And I assume that was probably one of the proof copies, but man, this thing looks good. <laughs> and I didn't even get to see this fancy pouch. So I have removed the shrink wrap, folks, but we've got a whole bunch of stuff yeah. in here. And we got this pouch. Now, this pouch thing was a was a pre-order. You only got this if you pre-ordered it, right? You get it. If we still have some available, you you get the game if you order from direct from NES. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's not. Some are going into distribution, but a very very limited uh, number. And the retailers pay a premium for that. Uh, but it's no it's no difference in price if you buy it directly from NES. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So now these it, are metal arrows these yes. are to mark wind direction at wind direction exactly okay. and okay. Uh, you put those on the map directly on the map scattered them about we found that in play testing that it helped to orientate the players to the wind direction because the wind is is uh plays an important part in the weather rules mm -hmm. 
this is, of course, the battle itself is in, uh, was it February of 1807? And the weather is, of course, hilariously bad. Uh, this entire time, <laughs> it was it was pretty bad. Um, some of the narratives differ. Some say that you know there was heavy snow snowfall all day long, but others say that there was a like a what we call a microburst mm-hmm. up here in New England. Uh, you know that that you get this snow squall, heavy heavy blizzard conditions, and. Uh, you know, from what I was reading, it probably lasted no more than an hour or so. Mm-hmm. And heavy snowfall is a uh, is a snow rate of about two to three inches an hour. So, so typical for New England in, in July, right? Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. So, uh, what what is it about Ilau? Because as you're undoubtedly aware. Um, this is one of, I think, three Ilau games that are likely to pop out in the next, in, in say, a 12-month right. span, right? So is is there some renaissance in, in interest in Ilau, or is it that Benningson's memoirs got published in English fairly, fairly recently, or wow. is it, you know, what is it? I don't know. Maybe, uh, you know, James Arnold's excellent book uh, kind of prompted uh some some recent interest uh you know winter's victory has been percolating for 12 years Mm -hmm. so you know if i didn't have so many distractions in my life i mean would have came out sooner but uh i don't know i can't i can't answer you but yeah we notice that ourselves and uh there are different scales uh different approaches so you know that's great everybody gets something Mm -hmm. so we got two books here there's a rule book and a playbook and the end they both come wrapped in this very fancy actually i want to ask about this you know why do you put these because i i've got these in killing ground and in jaws of victory as well um is there like a a an aesthetic decision that goes into putting these little wraps together for the booklets? Oh, everything at NES is an aesthetic decision. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, uh, and it can be a costly decision, mm. uh, but, um, it's, it's sort of our signature, you know, it's, it's something we do on our more premium games probably won't do this on the continuing brigade series of games that we have like dresden um uh, which will be coming out with more titles on that but um you know for this series it uh we 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 like to put a belly band around there it just kind of sets it off nicely when you open that box and you know, you just, you know, you're in for something special. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it, I feel like it adds a feeling, I'm about to make up a word, deluxity to the entire production of, or luxuriousness, I suppose, is actually, the, I think, the, of a better actual word that I didn't just make up. But we've got a 30, what, 38 page, 40 page rule book here. Yeah. Uh, how would you describe the overall game system weight for this particular game? Because it does. Well, the game system uh, stays pretty close to the original Wellington's Victory uh, sequence mm-hmm. of play and uh, the uh, way the combat and the shock uh, combat, the fire combat and shock combat work um, is pretty much the, the, the same. Uh, we've added some granularity by going to a 10 sided die. So for the, uh, um, morale levels or, or effectiveness ratings of the units, you know, there's, there's more, um, there's a wider range that, uh, that go with them. Uh, and, uh, the sequence of play, like I said, is, uh, the same asymmetrical, sequence of play that was used in Wellington's victory where you I was have... about to ask that actually <laughs> if you inherited the same asymmetric sequence of play from Wellington's victory with with no yes. basic structural changes that is and you know there was a lot of talk internally here at NES about 
making a change to a symmetrical uh, sequence of play. I wanted to, I, I thought the original sequence of play or the asymmetrical sequence of play worked well in this particular battle because of the it kind of um, helps with the differences between the Russian army and the French army. Uh, at the time, there were considerable differences, and and uh, the French had a uh, had a better fire uh, uh, capability, and the the uh, I wanted to give the Russians the the shock combat, and so the asymmetrical sequence play allows that organically to happen within the play of the game without you know going into a lot of other stuff. Mm -hmm. So it's not certain, you know, if we go go on with the game series if that will continue uh, we may look at some symmetrical options on the sequence of play and uh, see how see if that works out for us okay that'd be it because that's that's actually why I'm asking because it feels like there's maybe a little bit less of a difference between the say French and British armies that one might encounter in some of the peninsular war battles than one might find between the French and the Russian armies, or say the French and the Austrian armies for much of the period right. as well. So uh, we'll get to the counters, the many, many, many counters in a minute here. But the books look gorgeous. They're full color. They're on a nice matte finished paper. Now I'm going to also ask you, this is entirely printed and assembled and all that jazz here in the United States, correct? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. It's right. printed. I knew the answer to that question, but I wanted it's... you to say so. It's even it's all done. It's all printed and made in in New England. The only thing we do, the only thing we do outside of New England, is the uh, mounting and the die cutting of the counters, mm -hmm. which is done well, by the, a great company out of Philadelphia called Surefold. Um, mm -hmm. They do they do work for a, a ATO. They do work for Clash of Arms. Uh, they have a lot of experience. You know, I went down there. I met their team uh really a bunch of great people uh and uh very conscientious they they really look at the the counters as they're mounting them and stamping them they they take a look at the fronts they take a look at the backs you know they're pulling samples as they're going along and and you know they do a great job i get a very very small percentage of non-usable counters so I'm, I'm pretty happy with them that's great. And and the counters, and again, we'll see them in a minute, are absolutely gorgeous, uh, both in terms of design. Well, I'll talk about yeah. that when I pull the counters out of the box. How about that? So it looks like yeah. there's, what, four scenarios in a campaign here? Am there's I getting that four right? Four scenarios. There's two one-map scenarios, mm -hmm. which get people started. And uh, th the first scenario it just eliminates a lot of the rules, so you don't have to deal with uh you, you 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 can deal with less rules uh, and get yourself into the game and the game system that's uh pretty quickly um and then the second one map scenario has just adds a few more rules uh get you acclimated to uh things like the ordering system and the command system the fatigue uh and then um the Third scenario is just the Battle of the Eighth. Uh, I want to go back to the first scenario is the 7th, mm -hmm. um, February 7th. So that's the uh, day before the big battle. And that's a median engagement. Mm -hmm. And it starts in the afternoon. And, and so it's a shorter, so it's a shorter game. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. But that uses fewer counters and... Uh, it's a it's a nice it's a nice little scenario. Um, the uh, the battle scenario for the eighth is mm -hmm. is our flagship scenario. Mm -hmm. And in this, is that this one or or the third scenario? The oh, third that's one. this guy. Gotcha. And of wow. course, I'm going to mention that everybody's going to love that you've got a Davu focused scenario. Oh yeah, I love that. that's got to have that. That's that's rock and roll. That the mm -hmm. there's no French that start on the map. The the uh, uh, Davout's third course starts starts coming on in the south, and uh, it's a little bit of a surprise for the Russians. They have to you know turn to meet the threat, and it's a it's a tense 
tense little scenario, which is, mm -hmm. uh, and that's the shortest. It's the shortest of all of them. I mean, you can mm -hmm. get through that in, you know, a long day or, you know, maybe a couple of evenings. Mm -hmm. I'll have to look up uh, to see what, uh, how to say, oh, oh shit, it's Davu in Russian. So, <laughs> we're in trouble now. Uh, anyway, so the meat and potatoes is here in uh, in the third scenario for the eighth, win a winter's victory, and this is all four maps. What it looks like, correct? Yeah, this is a and there's a like a lot of stuff happening, right. but it ends areas. where that little square is on the previous oh, page, right this, there. Nope, previous page, right this there. Gotcha. Yeah, that, that ends there. The rest of it is optional. Okay. And we went with fewer scenarios, but deeper ones. So there's um, reinforcement options in this scenario, there's, uh, which are kind of interesting. So you could play one game and then you can play another because it's a, it's a sizable investment, mm -hmm. but you can add, you know, different reinforcement uh, options for this scenario. Uh, there's actually three different options. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of a scenario multiplier. Uh, and then um, we have the, we, you have a way of, in this scenario, what's interesting is you can play the one map first day, the February 7th scenario, uh, uh, the um, delaying action, by, by Benenson, you can play that scenario and then you can take the losses and the conditions of the units from that scenario, transfer them to the battle scenario for the eighth mm -hmm. and then play it that way. So you can affect play both, both uh, uh, games, both days, uh, skipping, you know, all the nighttime stuff and all that. And that's that's pretty neat as well. And then we've got a grand, what I guess I'll call the grand campaign on the seventh and eighth. And this is going to be the entire shebang. Correct. With how, so, how much of the scenario specific rules from this scenario are the same scenario specific rules for the scenario for the eighth? There's quite a bit. The The difficulty with combining the 7th and the 8th days uh, is that on the Russian side, they completely changed the structure of their their army. So Bennington, at that evening, the evening of the 7th, he created these wings that did not exist on the 7th mm -hmm. and moved uh, cavalry units around cavalry brigades, created a cavalry reserve forces, uh, he created artillery reserve forces, he created artillery grand batteries, three of them, that had their own commands. And so the challenge was to, you know, how do we go from the 7th to the 8th and make all that happen. And what we did with that scenario is we allowed a lot of flexibility for players to kind of devise their own setup. And there's a there's a there's a um, display card for the um, Russian army that allows players to decide what divisions are going which what wings or even to have less wings or no wings if they if the russian player wants to fight it without the the wing commands mm -hmm. so that's uh <laughs> i'll be interested to hear from people that actually play that scenario because that uh, was it's 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 somewhat it's somewhat of a self-directed kind of thing which we state up up front but all you know the everything's there um as a as a toolkit for players but uh they're they're gonna have to connect some dots uh, in order to play this 
Okay, fair enough. So we have a section of optional rules at the back. Are there any of these optional rules that you personally consider invaluable or things that you would definitely want to play with? Uh, well, the first one that comes to mind that was that the players that the playtesters here in house liked a lot was uh, the uh, girly dra dra dragoons. Um, <laughs> so, um, and uh, what else? Uh, those are the are those the drunken dra No, those are Jaegers. No, no, that's uh, different. Um, which one? There you go. Yeah, I'll have to read about oh, this. I yeah. am not an expert the, on this um, battle. The, the optional rules for the Russian light -like guns. That's those are those those were well received. Uh, in, any that has the um, N um, next hmm. to them. Oh, okay. Our our favorite were 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 used uh, quite a bit in play testing. Okay. Okay. Very interested in exploring the command system that you've got in place here as well. That is a particular interest of mine. And then we get some designers' notes in the back, which I'm I've probably asked you several of the questions that you answer in those designers' notes. Um, so I'll just observe that they're here and that people should read them. And I also, I guess, point out that uh, you can download the rule book from the New England Simulations yes. website. And I have already done so because that's my preferred way to read rules. As yes, person. and those that will be that rule book up uh, download and the playbook download, uh, among other some things, will be evolving uh, with corrections and errata as 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 we go forward. And we and we keep that up to date, much like uh, we do with the uh, Jaws of Victory and the other games. So. Fantastic. Now this is four maps in it as I recall. So I'm going to set one up um, just so folks and use it as a backdrop for the rest of this, just so people can get a sense of the artwork and stuff like that. I can, again, having seen this on a table, uh, this past Compass Expo and at a previous Compass Expo from a few years ago actually was there as well. Um, and it is very, very nice. So let's set it up here. Try and get it as kind of flat as we can. If it's not laying flat, folks, that's because of the layout on my table, not because of the maps. Uh, but they are paper maps. Uh, how, how often do you get people complaining that the maps are not mounted? I'm just curious because I think uh, that's a ridiculous request, but I hear it all the time. Oh, ma maps aren't mounted. Almost never. Good. Um, Good. And... Uh, you know, I, I pay a lot of, t my background is graphics and graphic arts production, and I pay a lot of attention to the physical quality of the components. So we can tell the, um, the map just to get a little geeky here is printed on a, uh, a, a company, uh, the paper company is Cougar. It's hmm. uh, printed on a, uh, white, what's called a smooth sheet, uncoated stock. It's a uh, eighty-pound text, so mm. uh, it's a it's a premium uncoated stock. It feels really nice, um, as do all the other components. And you know, I think like with the Killing Ground, I have yet to hear from somebody that said that you know after all these years that their maps are splitting at the at the folds. Mm -hmm. That is um, one thing that I don't I don't want to see on an NES game. So oh, I should say not. Uh, you know, we we try to use premium components. And and, and again, it has that has been noted by the community. <clears throat> so we've yeah. got a whole bunch of player aids and they all feel really nice and they look gorgeous as well. We've got some scenario cards for a variety of the scenarios. Um, we've got a couple of player aid cards, which are a bit of an odd size uh, with the shock combat results on them. Yeah. And again, those uh, like the shock combat results table, that that is a direct uh, lift off of the, the, the style of it is lifted off of the original Wellington's Victory. 
shot combat tables. So people that played Wellington's Victory, people that liked it, they're going to be very, very comfortable with this package. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I do have Wellington's Victory, but I actually have not played it, nor have I played either of the other two games that SPI used, used, did using that system, A versus Wellington and Monmouth. I have, yeah. I have all three of them and haven't played any of them. Although my excuse for Monmouth is that the counters are radically misaligned. So at least I have a reason for Monmouth. Oh, that's too bad. Oh, it's I was I was a play tester for SPI on Monmouth. Oh yeah. So yeah, that the goes game back itself is supposed to be decent, but uh, yeah, but yeah. My count the registration on my counters is 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 let's throw it in the trash and just make my own counters. But, so again, uh, that's the fire combat tables, and and it was it used the same uh, layout as uh, the Wellington's Victory, except I expanded it quite a bit. One of the things that I did was I separated the infantry from the artillery, where in Wellington's Victory, they're, they're the same. They use the same mm -hmm. table. Uh, this allowed me to be a little more nuanced in how targets uh, or units take fire from both the infantry and the artillery. Mm -hmm. And I went one step further and separated the Russian from the French and Prussian fire. Mm -hmm. uh, so because I just didn't want to have, uh, you know, m minus one for the Russians when they fired and all that kind of thing. I wanted to, I wanted a, a little more gran granularity out of the results. And it's just pretty easy. If you're the Russian player or the French player, you just use that table, but there's no additional rules for doing that. And it achieves the, you know, the, the, the differences in, in how they executed fire that I was mm -hmm. looking for. Mm -hmm. Also now, love that you have set up cards for the various scenarios. That's right. Much appreciated. So if you look at one of the setup cards, um, like that is, 20.3. So that is the French. That's the French setup. If you, if you turn that around, there you go. Mm. So that is the setup for the French for the flagship scenario, the, the battle on the eighth. And that is everything you need to know to set up the French units. Mm -hmm. uh, then once you're finished setting them up, you turn it over mm -hmm. and that's the reinforcement side. Mm -hmm. So same way uh, with the uh, same way with the the allied, mm -hmm. you have the setup on one side, and that's everything you need to know to set up. And then if you turn it over, it it gives you the reinforcements and additional information uh, for playing the scenario. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that that just shows a lot of thought to me has gone into the physical design of these play aids. And then I wanted to add portraits of the key participants, you know, to give people an idea. I, I think it's uh, it's it's kind of fun to put a face to a name when mm -hmm. you're when when you're playing. Yeah. Plus, we all know what Napoleon looks like already, right? Le oh, less yeah. so with. Uh, let's apparently, say less he looks a lot like Joaquin Phoenix. Yeah, apparently, I noticed that. <laughs> Uh, here's Bagration, Markov, Barclay de Tolly, who's probably my personal favorite Russian commander of the era. There's Murat and Sult. So that's pretty awesome. Right. So that card that you're holding there, mm -hmm. that is a scenario card. That is only a, that, that's only one card for the scenario. It's not it's not broken in two for, for both sides because the scenario is smaller. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so this doubles as sort of the army organization card too. It sounds like right. If you unfold one of those, so so that is the Allied or Russian organization for the eighth, the Battle of the Eighth, and that is actually a fatigue display. It's a it's a brigade commitment and fatigue display. So. When you commit the brigade, 
the leaders, the brigade leaders and the division leaders are on that display, you pull them off of the display and you put them on the map with his units. So he is committed. He's, he's, he's good to go. And every hour that he's on the map, you'll see that there's a fatigue level box underneath. Every hour that he's on the map, there's a fatigue level that goes up. Uh, the, he, he accrues fatigue points. And then when he get to a certain level, it changes their fatigue status for the units in that brigade. So there's no writing down or checking off boxes for fatigue and that kind of thing. Uh, it's just, it's all done on the display and on, on the map. And they look amazing too. Uh, and here is, of course, Bennigsen himself. Uh, what is the turn scale? Are these, what, 20-minute turns, 30-minute turns? 15 minutes a turn. 15? Okay. Yeah. Okay. That sounded approximately correct just based on the unit scale. But uh, And then lastly, since we're not going to focus too much on the box, uh, we're going to take a look at the absolutely gorgeous counters. So I have been wanting to ask you this for some time now. Because I love the old SPI counters with their matte finishes. And it, it sounds like you may share that opinion, considering that all the New England simulation stuff I've got, which is, this will be the fourth, I guess, fifth product at this point yeah. for me. Uh, all of them have this matte finish on them. Yes. They are harder to do. And they're harder to do well. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is there's all kinds of um, production reasons why that is. But it's much easier to control ink hitting the paper on glossy stock or mm -hmm. matte coated stock or what's called a coated stock than it is an uncoated stock. Mm -hmm. uh, so you get a you get a sharper, brighter look on glossier paper. If you use um, an uncoated stock, you have to use a very, very good sheet, a premium sheet, something that's got a high cotton content. And it has to be smoothed out. So when you're, I specify the paper with the printer and I go over it with them and they show me samples and it usually has to be, the paper has to be ordered. It's not something that he's got sitting in, you know, the warehouse mm -hmm. because I need a very uh, good, smooth, uncoated sheet in order to achieve the detail and crispness of, of those counters. Mm -hmm. And they look just fantastic. Just fantastic. Are these 9 16th inch counters? Am I right about that? Yes. Well, like I said, it's an expensive way to go. I mean, I have to, I print, I print the litho sheets front and back. They're printed separately up here in um, Massachusetts. And then they are shipped. Those litho sheets are shipped to Philadelphia to Surefold. Surefold mounts them front and back and then die cuts them, then ships them back to to Massachusetts. So it's not only the printing cost that's more expensive, the die cutting cost uh, doesn't, doesn't change, but it's shipping them back and forth from, uh, from New England to Philadelphia and back. That's, you know, that's an extra 900,000 bucks. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Not, and, uh, not a trivial amount of money. No. So, you know, but I want that look. I want, I, I want that. I want to be, I want, I want people to say, boy, you know, I mean, is Richard Berg, the late, great Richard Berg said to me when we were having breakfast one time, he says, you know, if he gave me the best compliment I ever had, he said, if S, if the original SPI had survived, it would look like New England simulations. The uh, the leaders are are really sharp looking. The leader counters with the portraits. The readability is high. You don't put vitally needed information for every single combat on the back. That's also appreciated. 
But yeah, these are gorgeous. <clears throat> yeah, the um, the combat counters. That's uh, the column on one side and mm -hmm. the unit in line on on the other. So mm -hmm. um, that you know keeps you from having to use a separate marker for that. Yeah. Well, if yeah. they go on extended line, you got a separate marker. But uh, yeah, as I would I would anticipate. Right. I mean, you're covering you're in the second those are you have skirmish to... units that can be broken out of a battalion mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and and deployed. The uh, light battalions can completely break down, mm -hmm. um, and most of the French line battalions can deploy one skirmish unit out of each battalion. Okay, now uh, some that, that's one of the questions that I I anticipate folks asking is actually, what changes did you make to the skirmishers? For this versus the original implementation in Wellington's Victory, because having never played it, that is the thing I have heard people complain about was the way skirmish. Yes, the um, skirmish units in Wellington's Victory were pretty powerful. They were they were too too powerful. They uh, their their fire was uh, fire capability was very high, and. Uh, their morale was was very high. Now, now their morale or effectiveness would be high because the light troops were some of the best troops in the army, you know, except for the guard. But uh, the the light battalions, uh, the 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 French and the British had the best light troops on the continent, probably due to their experience in North America, um, not only fighting each other but fighting the uh, in, indigenous uh, peoples. Hmm. I hadn't um, thought of that, but yeah, I'm sure that's a factor, actually. And so that experience, you know, that experience, that was like a 50-year experience. Mm -hmm. um, because uh, every time there was a European war, they got start, they're fighting over here, too. Right. Well, there were four encounters with the French the British had before the American Revolution, and then they're fighting the American Revolution which mm -hmm. a lot of the colonial troops were, you know, some, particularly the older officers or NCOs, were veterans of the French and Indian Wars. So. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, I digress. Um, the, uh, the, the, the skirmishers, um, plenty of skirmishers for the French. The, the Russians don't have as many. Uh, they have these uh, Jaeger battalions that they could break down, but... They don't. Uh, they don't have as many skirmishers as the French, and it 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 becomes telling during the battle because of the the Russians. You know, for the Russians, it's a skirmishers are a limited resource, and when they mm -hmm. start running low, they they start to feel it. Mm -hmm. I see your die cutting's top notch too. <laughs> well, we want to make it easy. We want to make it easy for people to get the counters out. Actually, I'm going to make this suggestion next time on the back of the box. Put self punching counters because that's yeah, basically that what sounds, they're doing. Let me note that down. There we go. I'm I'm available for marketing consulting yeah. as well. But to get back to your question about the skirmishes and and what the differences are, uh, I made quite a few differences in the in the in the skirmishes. Um, the fire the fire capability of the skirmishes has been reduced tremendously in um, Winter's Victory. So. You know, on the fire table, they are less likely to hit. Uh, and there, I added a um, a morale only check for the uh, fire results. Um, and uh, this this I think gives a much better feel for what the what the skirmishers can do when they're out in the open, when they're when they're deployed, like in a clear terrain. Um, and they're up against cavalry. They are they are toast, and that wasn't the case in uh, uh, Wellington's victory. Also, if you stack too many of them, if you have too many of them in the hex, then their target class changes, so they become much easier to hit. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to stack a bunch of skirmishers together. You might as well keep them in line if you're going to do that. Correct. Yeah. So. Um, you know, there's there's a number of others. Uh, I, if you haven't stacked in a 
in a village hex or a woods or something like that, they can they can um, separate their fire. They can, like if you have six skirmish units, they can fire in all six hexes uh, mm. around mm. them. So, so there's been a lot of a lot of changes. Um, so the production here, Mark, I got to tell you, Louis, is absolutely phenomenal. Um, and you know that's that's one reason why I wanted it for myself. But also, I'm kind of on fire for Napoleonics and American Civil War at the moment. Um, so, and hey, might as well jump on the Ilau train, right? <laughs> Everybody's doing an Ilau game. Obviously, Ilau is where it's at right, right now. Uh, but this looks uh, this looks uh, you know on the heavier side uh, when compared to something like. Uh, the Sound of Drums project uh, has mm -hmm. produced, and I think that I'm not sure if that's officially out, but I know some people have it. If American copies are on a phone, but this is the other one that I was waiting for big time, actually, uh, well, just because you know, you know I yeah. had seen it. Just, just, just play one of the one map scenarios, and that's mm -hmm. you know. And I uh, especially appreciate you coming on here, Mark, and I'm very grateful for a for that. Um, and that now I can actually put this on a table, so that'll be awesome. Because uh, I want to, I want to, I want to fire this up and see uh, see how it goes. Right? Might as well play with the beautiful new pieces rather than the TSR pieces I have for Wellington's victory. Right? Um, yeah. Just, I, I I would be remiss in not mentioning the contrast that immediately leaps to mind between. TSR's 1985 or whatever it was counters and and these just amazing 2024 gorgeous oversized uh, counters that are in this box. It's an absolutely beautiful game, beautiful production. Um, and you know one of the reasons why New England Simulations has the reputation it does is taking your time and and getting it right. You know. Yeah. Well, as the old commercial said. We will print no game before it's time. Apparently not. So I pretty much have the inside track from talking to Marty as far as what, uh, you know, where this was in terms of, and I got number 133, by the way. Um, so it's 800. I, if you don't want to answer this question, you don't have to, and I'll cut it out and post. Um, did you print 800 copies or are there more than that? There are more than that, uh, but there are only 800 deluxe versions. Mm-hmm. And okay. we're we're down to you know less than two hundred. Okay, so, so that's good. You know. Um. Anyway, it's it's the the people that support NES have been fantastic over the years, and uh, particularly with with this production, we had a lot of delays uh, as we were we were trying to get it finished up. Um, and uh, we went through review after review after review, and it kept getting delayed and delayed and delayed. And um, the guys that pre-bought, you know, expecting it to be out in four to six months, it, you know, they they unfortunately uh, waited a year. And you know, I want to I want to apologize to them for that. Um, but I'll have you know, they, I've been talking people off the ledge for at least four months. <laughs> But they they stuck with it, and um, I hope that uh, they were pleased in the end. I am, uh, from what I have seen so far, I am very pleased. This looks like it is right up my alley in terms of complexity level and scale and topic and and my idiosyncratic aesthetic sense that I apply to war games sometimes. It's actually the first thing I pre-ordered from New England Simulations. As opposed to buying Jaws of Victory from Milt directly, um, <laughs> I bought one of his, his designer copies, I think. Okay, but uh, but that's a, a fantastic production as well. Uh, what's up, what is an up next for New England Simulation? Is it John's John Butterfield's on Hell's Highway? Yes, that is the next one. Um, I've started working on the art, uh, and uh, he's been, he's been working on the, uh, changes and updates to, to the game for the past few years. Mm -hmm. Um, 
you know, he's he's excited about working with me. I'm I'm excited with you know having his his uh, name added to to our portfolio. I mean, it's John uh, Butterfield. Come on. Oh yeah, you know. So uh, we're I'm I'm just thrilled. I'm just I'm just so happy to that that he 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 agreed to to let me do this. So to 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 let me redo hell's on hell's highway mm-hmm, mm-hmm. i have mm-hmm. actually spoken to john about it and i am very excited and i am going to uh to bully both of you into doing this when that comes out whenever that is which folks is not going to be that soon so hold your horses <laughs> well be patient it'll come out let them take their time it'll be um, fine it looks like i'm going to have more time on my hands uh, very soon and so i'll be able to give nes more focus in 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 my life that's great so we can expect uh, you know a couple releases a month from you starting next year yeah oh yeah easy you know yeah. just, uh, you're the laughing in the background yeah yeah my uh, team is uh what is this know. guy nuts <laughs> no yeah they I can sign up for that. They uh, they kind of know how it goes here at NES, and mm-hmm. uh, you know they 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 put up with me and and you know my my you know narcissistic or not narcissistic but uh, uh, just weirdness. Um, so now nah, they're 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 great, very supportive, and. Uh, I it uh, Winter's Victory could not be the game that you see now without without the support of the uh, in-house team and associates at, at at NES. So it's 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 just really a tremendous effort on their on their side and uh, extremely supportive uh, to get this out. Can't wait to play it. And uh, big props to you and the entire New England Simulations team for putting up with all the vicissitudes that are inevitable with this kind of stuff and getting out such a such a beautifully produced game well thank you thank you for having me thank you for coming really enjoyed it massive thanks to the patrons of ardwolf slayer whose support and encouragement make what we do at ardwolf slayer possible thank you patrons links to help support the channel are in the video description so check out the patreon the ko-fi and the merch store where you can get snazzy ardwolf slayer t-shirts drinking vessels and other cool swag there is also an affiliate link for noble knight games in the video description if you buy stuff through that affiliate link it helps to support the channel with noble knight store credit thank you noble knight until next time thanks for watching and happy gaming uh but it's it's a stunning production and i could not i did sneak a peek it's like i as i felt like it the the dirty little kid sneaking peeks at the Christmas presents because <laughs> uh, I took the shrink yeah. cap off and I, I carefully put everything back in the box in the exact order that it was in when it was packed. Um, but I couldn't, I couldn't help it. Well, it you know, mail it back to me. I'll shrink wrap it again. And then you can, uh, it's no, no, you can, we won't you can have be, the we thrill be doing all over. that, but thank you for the kind offer, Mark. <laughs>